Lab Coats. Welcome to another webinar, everybody. This time we've got Don and Gino and Scott. Woo! Yeah. Who was my original connection to Don and Gino. And guys, <laughs> welcome to the show. Today we want to touch on something that really hasn't been talked about. And that's really how does all this free money work? Right? A lot of people are throwing out PPP, EIDL and unemployment and all this stuff. And the fact is that that all sounds great, right? Because the government did give us a stimulus to work with, but is it going to affect us? Do we need to pay some of this back? And let's get into the details guys. But uh, first I like an intro for those of uh, uh, that are listening that don't know Don and Gino and Scott. I'll start with Don. Don, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks for having uh, us part of Lab Code Agents. Really excited. We've worked with you before, Tristan. You're always adding value, and that's what we want to do. And that's something that Gino and I have been working on doing for 10 years now. We actually started a radio show, the Don and Gino Show, 10 years ago now, as of what, April 1st, believe it or not, April Fool's yeah. Day. <laughs> and uh, with the goal, of, and it was through the last crisis, actually, that we started it during the, uh, the Great Recession. And we decided to start a radio show to give people information, options, somebody to talk to, answers, all that good stuff and disseminate from the fake news, let's put it that way. And it's been something we just really enjoyed doing. We actually pay to do it. And it's, it's helped out us, a lot of our clients, and educates us. As you know, when you get, you get to do all these webinars, you learn a lot. You learn a lot from these experts, and we've had thousands of experts on from all over the country, and now we want to continue with that sharing and hopefully update your great listeners with what's really happening out there. I think that's the key. That's the key. Oh, and 33 yeah. years in the industry. I have to throw oh, that only? <laughs> I started when I was 12. <laughs> you don't look past 16, for sure. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> it's, the new hair, it's the new haircut. <laughs> yeah, it's in. It's in. Yeah. I How guess I'll you, jump in next. Uh, so I've been in the industry for about mm, 17 years now. And gosh, almost like 14, 15 years working with Don. Uh, I was a little green when I met Don and came to work for him as a loan officer at the Mortgage Advisors Group, which was his company. And then, as he mentioned, we merged with Skyline and then went, went through the Great Recession together. And at that, when the show was born, uh, one of the things that we always said, we wanted to guide you to personal and financial wellness. That was the goal of the show. And that never changed. It never wavered. I don't know if when we set out to do that, we knew exactly what it was going to mean, uh, but it gave us guidelines and a mission to stick to for the last 10 years. I love it, guys. Well, thanks for being on. And then Scott Edwards, who is my connection to you guys. And that's that's uh -huh. right. Scott, the mortgage doc in the house. I've been doing this 18 years and uh, just honored and humbled to be here, uh, to be working with Don and Gino over here at uh, Now Finance of America. And uh, knowing you, Tristan, uh, since the first Lab Code Agents event over in Atlanta, even before then. So, uh, so yeah, so just honored to have Don and Gino on the show. They've got incredible insight and information. They're very well connected to many of the uh, mortgage rates in the industry right now. And uh, uh, so it's going to be exciting. I'm excited for the stuff they're going to bring. All right, guys. Well, let's get right into it. I want to know what the hell is going on with the mortgages right now? Are, are, are mortgages being done? Are they being delayed? What are we looking at? Because I'm concerned. Yeah, well, uh, I'll start with the, the why. So the Fed did this great thing to keep everybody happy or to keep everybody at peace saying, guys, don't worry. If you're having a problem, defer your mortgage. And, and they yeah. did that without thinking what all the consequences were going to be. Uh, and the way I kind of like look at this is, you know, sometimes you're like, well, I'm not exactly sure what plug and how to turn off that breaker. I'm just going to go turn off a breaker outside and see what happens. And, <laughs> and, and I think that's what they did. They turned off a breaker and said, let's see who screams. And different facets of our industry have been screaming about the problems that they caused, trying to do something good, but the problems that they caused to the system. Uh, and more than anything, these deferrals and the impact they have on servicers. So over the last few weeks, we've been working really hard with them to, uh, you know, put the federal government to try to put smaller servicers have access to capital like big banks do. So a lot of times they just, just they do things thinking of the big banks. They don't think about all the small business that's in the background. Okay. And Scott can talk a little bit to 
what impact that has had in loans. So there's this big, this big macro issue creating micro problems for us. Yeah, well, bottom line before Scott goes in about the loan piece of it, it, it basically caused a problem with the fact that even though the government said, hey, don't worry, we're not going to kick you out of your home or we're not going to uh, uh, foreclose on you, the investors or the servicers still have to pay the investors that money, the principal and interest. And they're like, well, well where's that money coming from? We don't have that in, in, you know, sitting there except for maybe 1% to 2% we expect to be delayed or foreclosing or having issues, but the other 98% we plan on paying so we can pay our investors. So when they basically put on the forbearance, which is not free money, we'll talk more about that, it caused a big issue with our industry, that's for sure. But it definitely did. they're working with uh, the servicers to rectify that. And they are. And, and the thing is, on the front lines, right, with the forbearance, the issue is, is that let's just say you don't really need to take the forbearance, right? But you end up taking it because you're like, hey, I'm going to take those three months. What isn't being cl clearly defined is the fact that in three months, you're going to owe that money, right? They're going to want that money. Or you have to go into a whole modification. And that's a whole other process. So... You know, the tough part is, is that let's just say rates do potentially get down to a great rate in three, four months or, or where they are today, right? If they continue to stay where they are, people won't be able to capitalize on it because the guidelines, at least for now, they say you need a 12-month mortgage history. And you won't have that because you will have three months that are forbearing. So, you know, we don't know the exact ramifications of all of this yet, but we, what we do know now is that it's probably not a good idea unless you really absolutely need to take the forbearance. So let's look back a little bit. Let's look a little bit back at history, right? What we have is best served as history is what just happened in 2008. Yeah. And everyone who got a modification, which by the way, if you take a, more, a forbearance, it is a modification. It is a modification of the original terms of your mortgage, right? right? Whether they put it on the back, whether you pay it back over time, whatever it is, it's a modified terms. And so the way that was looked upon after 2008 was that loan modifications had waiting periods to reestablish income, to show that you'd reestablished yourself and come out of the hardship because supposedly you had a hardship. Otherwise, why would you have forbeared your loan? Now, I know that they didn't put any qualification strings on at this time because the system couldn't handle the amount of applications if we had to underwrite every single one of the applications. But the assumption is that you had some sort of hardship. Otherwise, you would have never requested a forbearance. And so... There will be a waiting period, like, like Scott mentioned, a minimum, we believe, of 12 months, unless there's a special government waiver on Fannie and Freddie loans. But portfolio loans will definitely look at it as a stigma on your record. All right. All right. Well, so with that said, then why is it getting harder for us to fund loans? Because I'm also seeing that, that that's happening as well. People, people are telling me, hey, look, we are in escrow and now it's getting really tough or under contract. And it's getting tough to fund. I've had a few of my friends say all of a sudden there's no more funding and we've had to fall out of escrow or uh, deals over. Like what's happening? Issue. We had a big liquidity issue in our, in our industry uh, that we feel will be somewhat temporary. We don't know the timing, uh, but this is kind of Gino's forte in this area of where we're at. He's a capital markets geek. Um, he watches, he talks to, I mean, we're very fortunate. The leader of our company at Finance America, Bill Dallas, has been through this uh, quite a few times. And he talks directly to Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Ginny Mae. All, he has a roundhouse call with all the top leaders in the industry. And he's lobbying for all our sakes to make sure that this is handled correctly. So we get some really good information that to share with you of why this stuff has happened because all you see is why why did all the jumbos uh lenders and the non-qm lenders disappear and we've been able to get a lot of insight on that of, as to why that has disappeared and why it may be coming back and when it may be coming back so let's let's kind of compartmentalize this a little bit because it's not the same for all lenders but there are challenges in the entire industry so we can look at wells fargo first Wells Fargo had a unique problem uh, that because they had been involved in the account opening scam, they had a capital constraint on how much money they could lend. And when they opened up the SBA and they filled their allotment of everything that within their cap over the first weekend, they had to go back to the federal government and say, 
we're not going to be able to do mortgages anymore because we're going to take all this money and push it into the SBA program for you. And so they did that. They shut down the entire correspondent division. So correspondent lending is when small non-bank lenders like us finance, I say small relative to the size of too big to fail, mm -hmm. uh, but movement mortgage, ourselves, guaranteed rate, you American funding, those size mortgage companies, we rely on banks like Wells Fargo to sell them our loans. Well, they decided to pull out like this. We received an email and they said, we're out. And so those, all those programs that Wells Fargo used to give to us all left the market overnight. Now that was actually- other lenders. Yeah, and that was actually the first large, big prime bank to, to actually take a big hit. Prior to that, you had lost the non-QM loans, the ones that had the more aggressive features. And that's, I think in every market, you should expect that when default and risk increases, product limitations will come. Yeah, and nice. the problem with those is, is that those places had no secondary outlet whatsoever. So those places shut off in the middle of escrow and said, I'm sorry, guys, we can't continue. Uh, when versus Wells Fargo was able to take the approach that if you're already locked and you're already in the system, as long as you close by such and such date, you'll be okay. So that's a differential between non-QM lenders, which was bank statement programs and that such, and then big bank. Uh, question, what is a non-QM loan? <laughs> so a non-QM loan is a result of our beautiful Dodd-Frank, uh, that really happy piece of legislation that we I had back Frank. <laughs> right through the other crisis. And they decided that qualified mortgages, QM, was going to be a set of loans that had a certain risk parameter, lower risk parameters. And then non-QM loans were going to have high risk parameters. And non-QM would be interest only, bank statements to qualify, asset depletion, features like that, which we would consider dangerous features in our industry based on what happened last time. So the sequence of events was you lose non-QM, then you lose big bank. I don't know if you saw or not, but Chase this weekend yeah. uh, also said that they will not take any loans other than their dream project. They will not take any loans with under a 700 FICO. So and no cash out. And has that down payment also changed from, let's say, 5% to 10% to then 20% down? Or no? So on the portfolio product, on anything jumbo, you're going to see everything is 20, maybe even 25% down in a lot of cases. Still, we still have 20% down now, but I wouldn't be surprised if we see 25% down very soon. And the reason that that would happen is the speculation in certain areas that you could potentially have declining income or declining values. So yeah. that hasn't happened yet, but that's something to look for soon is that if appraisers start marking declining values, Mm -hmm. on our appraisals, then we're going to have to start dealing with that as well. And in, in regards to that, just a side note, and this is on the real estate side, right? Because on the loan side, psh, I don't know much. Uh, but <laughs> on the real estate side, I do. And with what we're seeing in Los Angeles and Ventura counties is that the amount of properties that are being listed are a lot less, dramatically. And what it's causing in most of our areas here is that it's causing a demand. So if the home is priced well, if it's priced right, all of a sudden we're getting multiple offers. So if this market maintains itself as where it's at, I don't see a decline in value in our areas. And what happens after that? Well, then you're going to have an influx of people who are going to be like, oh, the market's ready to go. Let's go. Right. A whole bunch of buyers and sellers. So yeah, I don't, I don't see this, this world that we're in affecting the real estate market the way that peop some people are saying, oh my gosh, everybody's going to die. The economy is going to blow up. Everybody lost their jobs and we're all going to hell. I don't think that's going to happen here. Um, but, you know, there is a concern, obviously, for the economy, right? And how long it's going to take to recover. Guys, Lori Mickle has a question. Do you think that non-QM mortgages will come back soon? So I can actually answer that. So, yeah, so um, they actually are starting to come back. Right. So we have two specific investors that have already started rolling back bank statement loans, asset depletion. Um, so they are coming back, but they're going to be uh, more money down. Right. Not as much. Not You can't put as little as money as they were allowing. So they're putting 20 percent, 25 percent. We're still waiting on the official guidelines to come out for a couple of them, but uh, they are starting to come back. I know that Gino's been in talk with a couple of them as well. So do you have anything additional that you can add there? 
No, I mean, look, it's, it's a matter of they're going to go back to very, very safe lending. So we had a conversation right. with a couple of presidents of those companies and they said, yeah, guys, we're, we're feeling very comfortable that we're going to be able to lend at 60% loan to value uh, as, long as, as long as we have money, as long as we have capital. So they have minimum capital and they just don't want to take any risk with it. So ultimately, they're going to look at very low risk loans, super clean loans, and that pushes out, that pushes up FICO scores that pushes up down, uh, up down payments, and that pushes up reserves. And I'm gonna tee that up for you, Scott, a little bit, because we have, that's the same type of thing we're seeing on FHA, VA, and conventional loans as well, not just the non-QM. Yeah, I mean, reserves. I mean, reserves are gonna be, I mean, it's one of those big compensating factors that an underwriter and all the investors on the secondary market are wanting to see on transactions right now. So, you know, we're finding that we're needing two months, six months, depending on where we're at, FICO, credit, debt ratio. So it's uh, it's, it's definitely around right now. And uh, every lender is going to have their own little nuance, a little, uh, little uh, change from here and there. But uh, reserves are going to be huge. Reserves are important right now. So one of the other factors regarding the non-QM and actually even any of the lending is we just need some stabilization in the market. When the stock market crashed due to the fears, it created what's called margin calls, meaning banks that had reserves had to pay, had to come up with money for their margin calls, which reduced liquidity, the amount of money they had to lend. Therefore, their capital was less and they basically had to pull back. And that like they all the non-QM lenders, they don't have the capital reserves. That's why they had got shut down immediately because due to margin calls. A lot of banks couldn't, or I won't say banks, but a lot of lenders couldn't even cover their margin calls for a little bit. So it, it put a lot of fear in the market to where everybody said, I'm gonna keep whatever capital I have for the cream of the crop loans. Let's just put it that way. The ones we're very feel are very safe loans. We'll do those right now and then we'll wait till the market which is starting to, it's starting to stabilize. We're starting to see a, a, a more normal market. The feds are figuring out that actually buying too many mortgage-backed securities and mortgages to help keep rates down, but actually we're hurting lenders. And now they're, they're actually slowing down their purchases to help lenders out so that they don't lose money on their hedging, which are big words. The bottom line is between liquidity and hedging, it put a lot of fear in the market. And we're waiting, now it's starting to stabilize more and that will help bring back product and the lending lending industry. So we feel pretty confident moving forward, we'll be all right. That's good. Not like 2008 where we just lost everything and it wasn't coming back. Different world, different world. Oh, absolutely. I agree. absolutely. Scott, there's a comment for you. Your mic seem, seems like it's fading in and out when you talk, so just heads up on that. I appreciate that. Cool, and uh, there's a question, Ann says, so Tristan, are you saying that you feel the impact won't be significant on real estate, question mark, or is it simply pockets that will not feel the impact um, and I think from, from the, what we're seeing right now, I'm just using the facts, right? Um, our ears are really close to the ground as to what's happening out there with listings and things that are selling. Uh, it doesn't look like the impact will be as bad to real estate, but it's really going to depend on how deeply the economy is impacted by uh, it, how long people are going to be unemployed. How long does it take people to get back to work and start making money? Because that's really going to depend on, on how they can buy a home. Can they afford a home, right? How badly is it going to impact that? So we don't know, but it definitely isn't this, this what we have isn't driven by uh, any, any real estate problems that we've had. So that's a good thing, right? It's not even driven economically. It's just all driven by something that we've never experienced before. So this is our first time into this, but we're optimistic using the facts that we have. Yeah, have Don and I did a video to today. Don, do you yeah, want to? I was just going to say, we just did a video yeah. today on that. If you go to our YouTube channel, I'm going to have a little, little promo, but at nrecafe.com or donandgino.com, uh, we did a video just based on that, that this is not driven, this is not a mortgage melt, a recession, which we will have due to, you know, million, 20 million people losing their jobs, but it'll be short term, which is a B recession, meaning it'll go down and it'll rebound quickly. But the good news is this recession is not ho housing driven. It's more hospitality, transportation, all of them. They are actually going to feel the pain because it's going to take a long time for them to rebound, kind of like it took a long time for us in the Great Recession during the housing 
recession. This is not a housing recession. In fact, we feel that the housing market, I'm sure you agree, Tristan, will be what brings back the economy. Very true. Very true. We don't have enough inventory still. We still no, have pent up demand for 10 years of people not buying or bu building homes. And then with, you know that. And then with rates dropping down to where they're going to drop because they're going to continue to drop further. Where are they at right now, guys? Low threes? Low threes. That's insane. High, high twos, low threes? Mm -hmm. Guys, so, I put up your link, dongino.com forward slash NRE cafe. What is NRE? I'll put it up. Okay, good. Put it up on the chat. But what does NRE Cafe mean? So after we did the radio show for, I think, six or seven years, we decided that once a week wasn't enough. We weren't timely. We weren't able to get. That was great for interviews and for meeting people and talking about mac macro pieces. But we couldn't talk about things that were more topical like what we're talking about today. So we wanted to make sure to have something daily. So the National Real Estate oh. Cafe is our daily video blog. So we well, that makes sense. Guys, I love that. There. I love that, guys. So, uh, look, one thing that you said and, and that I really like was that this is going to affect a different side of, of the world that we're in, right? Not all of the economy. You're going to see more of the, what you said, the, the transportation, more of, more of, what did you say exactly? It was the transportation and the hospitality. The, you hospitality. know, the cruise ships are not going to come back for a year. Right. I mean, seriously. And you got Disneyland's are going to be affected. You got restaurants and all that. So they will be affected for a little while. And that's why we feel that the housing market will be, which is 25% of our GDP, is going to be yeah. a big factor in us re rebounding. And this is, this is where we, since we know this, okay, now I'm talking to the real estate agents here. We know this, right? So that means we need to be preparing now. So six months from now, seven months from now, You've actually been targeting the right people this whole time. So you know who it's affecting, right? But you know who also can purchase. Doctors, tech people, the movie industry, all these other people that there's still divorces, right? People are still throwing up for sale by owners, which is crazy, but they're still doing it, right? People are still going to move. Now you have to decide who you're going to target. It's not going to be the same. You have to be more strategic. And this is why what's going to happen over the next few months is a lot less agents are going to be in our world as well, right? Because they're not shifting and adapting fast enough. And, and that happens every 10 that, years, doesn't it, Tristan? Dude, it's a, it's a cycle every 10 years. But that's why the people that are listening in right now, we're telling you ahead of time, hey, it's happening. It's time to adapt. It's time to shift. It's time to pivot, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it's time to do that. Yeah, and so I think you can do that in a couple of ways. One is you have to show your people that you genuinely care, right? Reach out to people, just talk to them, see how they're doing. You you don't realize, but you're building equity and relationships for the future. If you just call to see how they're doing, maybe they haven't talked to anyone on the phone for three days, and it's just nice to hear someone's voice on the other side. Um, so there's things like that where, you know, I've made Somebody rang my doorbell and it blew my mind. It was one of my neighbors. And I'm like, oh my God, a human being. How exciting. You know? <laughs> so, funny. It was, or, uh, or the Easter Bunny dropped off some gifts at my house, right, Don? Yeah, uh, oh, yeah that would be me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so, that's funny. <laughs> so it's a, but it's the little things like that that are making a difference in how we feel today and making us remember who was there for us during a hard time? So I think- Well, and also making light of it. I mean, Tristan, you, you, you always have a good time. And that's why I enjoy being on your show and having you involved in what you're doing. You don't take life too seriously. You just educate and inform. And if you give back, then you don't have to worry about that stuff. And yeah. really, that's why we were talking, remember at the beginning of the show, we were talking about, we're busier than ever trying to give back right now and trying to disseminate all this information because it changes daily. And as we read it, we're like, oh, that's not right. That, that's not going to, we got to inform our, our customers and consumers and agents of what that really means to them. And also give them, you know, options and strategies and ways to get through because strong agents are really going to come up stronger than ever with this when they're figuring out how to virtually help people and safely help people and be there for them. You actually will have an advantage over anyone coming out of this. We're actually more excited about this opportunity than ever because like Finance America, I know because we're so well prepared and we can work, you know, we're large enough and we can work remotely that we're right. We're doing business as usual. We're actually, you know, having record months. So we're, we're ready for you. 
Guys, that's it. I think that's the key right there. Those agents, and then we'll shift over to forbearance and all that stuff, but uh, those agents that are taking this as an opportunity to adapt and grow are the ones that are going to come out of this and are going to be the new mega agents, right? Because they're the ones shifting right now. Guys, I'm going to share a video on, on the chat there. You can take a look at it just on how agents, because we get to interview so many people like you guys, mm -hmm. how agents are using Facebook to do events and premiere events for open houses. Very cool. And one of my friends, Catherine Rain, who we had on, she had 11 open houses over the weekend and put four in escrow, right? Wow. Meanwhile, you have these other agents saying, well, you know, I can't show the home, nobody's buying, nobody's gonna visit an open house online. And the total opposite happens. Right. Yeah, I think, you know, and, and I think it's Darren Hardy that taught us this years and years ago, but, you know, there's nothing positive that comes of the news. Right. So it, it brings negativity upon you. It brings negative thoughts upon you and it really contaminates your mindset. So you're talking about two agents in the same market with the same potential client pool having a completely different outcome just because they have a different mindset. So ignore the noise and keep your mind right and you'll thrive in this market. Yeah. That's exactly it. Guys, let's shift over to forbearance and then talk about uh, PPP and then EIDL just so uh, people understand that there are some possible ramifications as well. But let's talk about forbearance. Do you know, guys, uh, how many people have applied for forbearance? I don't know. So I'm just throwing that out there. I don't know. I have no idea. No? Okay, good. Can you explain <laughs> what forbearance is? Can you explain what forbearance is for those of those people that are tuning in that have no clue what the hell it is or maybe how even it works? Any of you? Well, yeah, I can answer that real quick. So it's, it's real simple, right? So a, a, it's a forbearance is simply they are deferring your, your payments for three months. Now up to 12 months, okay? So, but what they're doing right now is a lot of the banks are just giving you those three months right away. And uh, what's happening is, and I'm seeing a lot of the forbearance agreements that they're getting and they're all saying, <laughs> And they're all saying that you have to pay the full amount. So I had one that came over that was like $17,000 for four months because that was the four months of payments that they were going to miss. So wow. that, you know, so it's, they want that full amount due when the term is up or you have to apply for a modification or go through the other additional steps. The other thing that's coming up right now is everyone's saying that it's not going to impact the credit report. Well, what they're doing is, is they're putting forbearance on the credit report. I've had, a, I've had personal friends of mine that have gone through the forbearance process and their credit scores have dropped 35 points Whoa! Just because of that word forbearance going on there. So, you know, it, it's, it's something that's available to people who absolutely need it. Don't take it. I mean, I, I, I can't encourage everybody enough not to take it, if you don't need it, right? Because so, you don't want to miss out on that. But Gina, go ahead. Well, I wanted to talk about, so a lot of us are real estate investors on this call, I'm sure. Yeah. And, um, you know, we're, we're real estate investors and we have uh, 15 doors. And so when this happened, I was freaked out because I said, well, wait a second. If none of my people pay rent, that's 20 some odd grand a month I'm going to have to come up with on mortgages. And they said, well, don't worry, you'll, you won't have to pay your mortgage either. I'm like, no, wait, I have to pay my mortgage. I'm not letting this affect my credit. And I'm not letting this affect my future opportunities to borrow monies from legitimate sources for commercial real estate to invest at the lowest rates in history. I'm not letting this happen. And then, so then I started looking at PPP, right? Because I said, well, maybe I could use it to fill the gap for the tenants that don't pay the rent. Once I explained to the tenants that they had to pay me back over 12 months, and that it wasn't free money, guess what? Out of 15 of them, 13 of them paid in full, and two of them just took like a partial discount just to help them out a little bit. So communicate and educate and make sure that also, if we want this economy to come back sooner, we need to take the least amount of help possible. So let's not take abuse, abuse the system. Let's just take what we absolutely need. That's, that's so key, guys. I, and if you weren't paying attention, um, He's not going to repeat it, but I will for you. <laughs> and, uh, we can repeat it. We, we repeat it. I'll repeat it, damn right it. I'll repeat it. <laughs> Communicate with the people that are wondering what the hell's happening, whether it's your clients. I mean, guys, haven't you reached out to your clients and you say, hey, how are you doing? And all of a sudden, they're the ones who bring up real estate. Well, what's happening in real estate? 
Are people still buying, selling, refinancing? How's the interest rates? They're the ones bringing it up, right? Right. It's the same thing when it comes to everything else, right? Educate them. Do, can you imagine if my banker called me instead of me having to call the banks? And say, the banker would call me, Gino, and be like, hey, Tristan, so here's the thing. I don't know if you need PPP, but here's the application. It's two pages long. Here's EIDL. Here's how it works. You can go online and fill it out. Uh, but just wanted to help you out. Here it is. Now, that's never going to happen. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. So that falls on us. I Educate, agree. right? Communicate with your clients and those that need it. So, Well, when we, when we had that discussion with our renter, too, because at first it looks like, I mean, who doesn't? When you, when you hear you don't have to make your rent payment or you have to make your mortgage payment, it sounds like free money. It really does. It's, but we all know, Patty just put it on your, your thing, and basically we all know better that free is never free. If it right. sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And when our, one of our tenants basically called and said, hey, I'm going to have a hard time, we actually had a discussion instead of saying, oh, okay. We're like, well, what industry are you in? And what are your challenges? And how long do you think the challenge would be? Because we have to have that discussion because you know, we have to pay our mortgage still. We still have to figure out how to keep this home for you. So can we have a legitimate discussion? And we came to an agreement and the agreement was, is, hey, even if we reduce it, you're going to have to pay it back. We still owe that money. And they're like, ah, oh, well, then I don't need it, just all of it gone. <laughs> How about I just reduce it a little bit? And we're like, that's more like it, and we can work around that. But it's the same thing with a mortgage. If you just blow it off for three or six months, and you have to figure out how to potentially pay that back, that's hardships down the road that you're creating for a uh, temporary uh, gift. So be careful. That's all we're saying is really be careful out there. I see that Dennis, Dennis came in there with some numbers, says we topped $2 million dollars. Uh, I'm sorry, 2 million forbearance requests. That's what I thought. I thought it was 2.7 million was what I saw. Um, yeah. But you're going to see that number skyrocket because that number has a lag to it. Just like all reports we ever read, there's a lag factor to it. And most people didn't apply until they were into the month of April and decided that they were going to do it. Because the last few days of March, most people had already made their March payment. It wasn't critical. So right. If you really look at this, you really look at this has only happened in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. So that number is going to skyrocket and it'll continue to put strain on the system. Let's hope it doesn't go longer than the three months and then we'll be able to start recovering. Yeah, I think that's the key, guys. This is happening. Um, we're playing it by ear as we're going. So if everything was OK in the next week or two, right, things don't look that bad on, in regards to recovery. So the thing you can do for yourself is to continually stay up to date as to what's happening. You're coming here, asking questions to, to Don and Gino. Don, if people want to get a hold of you guys, we still have about 30 minutes, but if they want to get a hold of you guys, is there a place that they can go to, to reach you guys or Scott? Yeah, I know for us, the easiest way is Don and Gino at gmail.com. D O N A N D G I N O. Just like it sounds not a pizza place. Um, <laughs> you take orders by phone, Don? Yeah, yeah exactly. Although, we'll although right, right now, delivery is the same oh, thing. Oh, uh, pepperoni. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming to your house. <laughs> totally. But that's, uh, the, and uh, Don and Gino at gmail.com, Don and Gino at, G, at uh, Don and Gino.com, any of those. Everything's Don really and Gino. Just, yeah, Don and Gino at gmail.com is best. All right, cool guys. Yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about also how things are changing. We just a few weeks ago, just Don and I on the National Real Estate Cafe, we did a video saying, "Be careful, don't get scammed." Okay, these PPP and EIDL loans, and this is a massive opportunity for scam artists. So, do not respond to a link on your phone. That's a phishing scam. Okay, do not respond to an email that says, "If you need help, do this and that." Make sure that you take the same precautions that you would on any given time when you receive text messages or emails that are unsolicited and make sure that you proactively go seek the information from a good source like the county, like the state, like your bank, like the SBA website. Do not fall prey to a link that's going to ask you for your information on your phone. Predators are out in this market and they're going to, the same as we're hearing, and I don't want to digress too much, but wire fraud on real estate transactions is triple right now. It is very, very high. So just be very cognizant that this is the time when predators come out. It's a very important piece of this. 
So I wanted to speak real quick to something you said, Tristan, about educate and form, right? Help, you know, for real estate agents reaching out to their customers, right? For those of us who were around in 2007, 2008, and especially for Don and Gina who created the, the radio show, right? People remember, right? People remember the help that Don and Gino gave them back then when times were tough, right? People will remember you when you are helping them through this tough time. And so it'll pay dividends for all of you who are doing this and helping and educating all of your friends, your family, your customers, all that kind of stuff. So just wanted to piggyback on that. Hey, Tristan, another important piece, what's nice is, um, you know, a lot of people are paralyzed right now. I would imagine you talk to real estate agents on a regular basis. How do I, how do I sell somebody's home? How do I buy a home? How do I convince somebody? I know that's a big part of a lot of your uh, videos and your webinars and stuff, because we just did a video, same thing, talking about this, act, you know, what if you need to sell? Well, you know, you and I both know if you can find a, an educated uh, real estate professional that knows how to use virtual uh, tours and and now we can do virtual. Did we lose him? Oh, oh I think we lost him. Oh, no. This is face froze with a happy, <laughs> happy slash grumpy face. <laughs> somebody take somebody take a snapshot of that. Uh, I'm gonna take a snapshot and send it to you. That's awesome. That way you can. Make um, <laughs> that's the best. That's so good. Oh, um, man. All right, guys. So uh, as he's he uh, him back, he'll jump back yep. on. Gino and, and Scott, I want to go to you in regards to, let's switch now from forbearance because I, I think we, we understand that sure. uh, it's going to be all paid in bulk at the end. So save that money if you can, right? I, I don't think that, uh, here's a question about that before I end to the next one. Will that, do you think, cause foreclosures, short sales, or do you think that these banks will adjust with the government saying, hey guys, just adjust it. Don't don't request the whole bulk, just start the payment over at this time. What do you think will happen? So, you know, my thought is, is I think people have too much equity in their house for them to want to just let it foreclose. I mean, I, I think people have way too much money invested in their house from the principal that they've been paying down and the equity they've built. So there's no question. I think they sell way before they get into foreclosure. So how about you, Gino? What do you think, buddy? Yeah. I mean, look, that's the one thing that we have right now is we have equity on our side. So I think that's, all of us right now, if we had to sell our home, we have other than a few people that bought maybe in the last 12 months and maybe they bought with down payment assistance or a very small down payment, those people might be upside down on their homes. But the majority of people have equity and the majority of people still have employment. I mean, as you drive around a little bit and you still see, I say the economy is probably functioning at what 50% of normal, maybe if you had to pick a number out of the sky. And once we get it back to 80, 85, I think things will be pretty healthy. So I don't think that we see a massive REO market. I don't see that happening. We have zero inventory. So before that happens, supply has to increase dramatically. I don't see short sales and foreclosures. I think banks will definitely adapt and give modifications to most people and just throw those last three, four payments on the back. I agree. Yep. All right, I like that. I think I, I agree with you, man. I think that's what it's gonna end up happening, um, which I love. And that, that I think is more reasonable for the economy to, to, to progress because if it goes the other way, it, it could cause a lot of problems. So uh, guys, let's shift over to PPP and EIDL here. So in regards to, to PP, Triple P, I'm just going to call it Triple P. <laughs> Are you a rapper now? Boom! Right? <laughs> in regards the to Triple P. A for the PPP and the NBA. <laughs> Oh, we need to do a rap show. That's what we could. We actually we could come up with our own theme. Nobody will know what we're talking about. But then again, most rap songs you don't. <laughs> There's the PPP SBA EIDL. We could just do acronyms yes. all day. F -A -P -A. Totally. You got to talk to your CPA about your SBA. <laughs> P3. <laughs> Bill, Bill it's really, really, very, really, really going down a dark tunnel, guys. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all right. So look, Triple P. What what's the, what are the dangers that nobody is talking about? about the triple P? I actually think that that's probably one of the safer loans that's out there right now. Um, it, it, it's very well suited if you use it correctly, right? I think that's what's super important is that you can't use PPP to pay for your credit card debt that you had from before. That's not what it's for, <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> I know otherwise, 
be signing up for that. <laughs> I know people are going to do that. And so you got to be really careful how you allocate your funds. If you take one of these loans, document, document, document. I received this money and I utilized it here. And you have to be able to document that and defend that to make sure that you end up with, you know, some of this might be grantable. That's what everybody's heard. Oh, I'm going to get a grant. I'm going to get a grant. Yeah. Okay. Let's just say, for example, you're a restaurant and you were able to keep some of your staff and you were able to keep that staff going and you didn't have to let go of your staff and you supplemented the need that, so you paid your rent and you supplemented those things with PPP to keep your business alive, mm -hmm. then you're going to get part of that forgiven and everything's going to be fine. But like I said, but there's certain parameters, Gino, very specific parameters because it is a loan. And to, in order to get that grant, if you don't continue to keep 75% of your employees employed and, and all the other parameters, and there's numbers based on your 2019, your net income times two and a half. I mean, there's very specific guidelines. And your guy, your uh, Mark Kohler did a great job of that, by the way. I, well, I listened to it. Yeah. Um, that you guys broke it out really well for people. I mean, he spent an hour and a half. And if they don't go go back to your your videos that Tristan yeah, was nice enough to sit on for an hour and a half with. Let me let me grab that link right now because a lot of people will want to see that. That was good stuff. That was details. That was stuff that everybody needs to know so they don't fall into the trap of free money. It, there's okay. just no such thing. And then get trapped because that's a loan. And then you're in default of your loan if you don't do it right or you don't get the grant. One of the two is going to hurt you. Yeah, and now, so look at that, right? It's called the Paycheck Protection, right? So that's what it's for. It's so that you didn't terminate your employees and you were able to keep people paid so that they didn't hit unemployment. Ultimately, they're trying to balance here. They're trying to reduce the big figure of unemployment by reducing unemployment, still giving you payments as if they were unemployment through a different channel so that it doesn't look as scary to have 40, 50% unemployment if we're able to keep people in their jobs for this short amount of time. So you also don't have to fire and rehire everybody. Right. That has, that has all kinds of repercussions on its own. Yeah. So trying to keep the most amount of people employed through that program. Yeah. Um, it's not the personal play, pay, you know, personal pay paycheck for play. That's not what <laughs> PPP is. Guys, do you, do you have a, any checklist or any document that people can use to, to really keep track of those expenses? Because I think, that's going to be the key to keep track of what you're spending that PPP money on. So make sure that it is for the things that you're supposed to be spending it on. Because when it comes time to show and say, Hey, I spent it on uh, I spent it on a, a brand new car. Right. And then you're going to have to pay the whole money back. You're going to be a little shocked. Right. Yeah. That's where Mark Kohler comes in. We always do the disclaimer. We're not CPAs and we're not going to give you, we're not going to give you accounting advice. Talk to a CPA. <laughs> Sorry, think, we're always being careful on that end of it. Our strength is loans and not accounting, but we are paying attention like you are, Tristan, to what's really happening out there with the, all these opportunities and these stimulus programs and potential pitfalls. Yeah, and I, and I personally spend time going to the SBA website and I look on the SBA website and I read their frequently asked questions and there's a fact sheet uh, on the SBA website. Uh, almost everyone's come out with some sort of fact sheet. I would rely on that. Everything else, anything you hear from us is also just an opinion to a certain extent. Yep. We're just trying to warn you to say, be careful with the pitfalls. Don't, don't go into it blind and naive. Do your homework, do your research, get really great advice, follow the fact sheets, and go to the source. Um, in fact, I think I'm allowed to say this. I don't even know if Scott knows this yet. Uh, Finance of America Commercial will be, order, uh, will be originating SBA loans in the next couple of weeks. All right. Yeah, because, they're not, because the banks are not able to keep up with application volume. Uh, yeah the SBA is looking for other lending outlets to assist with doing loans. Nice. Uh, so that's we've been lobbying for that. The president of our company has been lobbying for us to help. Hey, we want to reach out and help. Let us do it too. We want to help our clients out. So, and help, you know, customers out. So we've actually been lobbying to be a, a source. Yep. So one of the things we did not discuss is fix and flip loans, fix and flip loans for people in the flipping industry have really, really become difficult. Um, they've become ex extremely scarce because future value became a mystery and they've actually froze 
a lot of those programs. So the, if you guys were doing a lot of flipping, you'll notice that that market's dried up quite a bit as well. Um, mm -hmm. I don't. I think that turn gets turned down pretty quickly as soon as uncertainty goes away. Um, Civic Home Loans is still got a nice size allocation, and they're still doing uh, flipping loans, but I think a little lower on the uh, loan to cost right now. All right, cool guys. Now let's go into EIDL. How uh, how do you guys see that being a possible danger? That's probably the one I know about least, to be transparent. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, that one's supposed to be easy peasy, one pager, here's your 10 grand, go away. Yeah. I still couldn't make it apply to any of my things. I mean, I went, that's what you've got to do. See, it's like a puzzle, right? Like the square peg in the round, in the round hole type of thing. Mm -hmm. And I looked at it. I said, can I apply for this? Do I want it? Do I need it? Nope. And then I went to PPP. I didn't quite meet it and i said no um there was a very small los angeles county um just mm -hmm. put out a very small program as well so county state and federal everybody's got allocation different levels you know. depending on your business too let yeah. me see if i can go grab that link on the county one all right well yeah. i have some other questions for you guys too so what loans are you seeing being affected the most with what's happening right now which ones are like out and which ones are our clients able to take advantage of right now? Ed, Scott. Yeah, I mean, so your standard products, your FHA, VA, conventional loans, anything below the conforming loan limit, right? Those are still very attractive right now. So um, uh, no question that there are certain lenders that are struggling more with certain products like FHA and VA. And Gino can probably speak more specifically as to why that's the case. But I can speak for us over at FAM that we're, I mean, we're pricing loans crazy at FHA, VA, um, and standard conventional loans. Once you get above the conforming limit, which for us is 510, 400, right? Once you get $1 over, it's a whole different ballgame. So, um, and again, I, I'm going to defer to Gino because Gino is my capitalist, uh, cap, capitalist, capital market guy. <laughs> capitalist. 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 Uh, um, yeah. Ultimately, that's, again, that's a function of a secondary market. Loans that were being traded on that secondary market, uh, that's a liquidity. Back to liquidity, full circle, back to liquidity. No buyers for that right now. So FHA did something really interesting. When this all first started melting down, what we didn't want is we didn't want to originate FHA loans for, there was like a two-week period of time. Because Scary. if you funded a loan, on FHA or VA, and it went into first payment forbearance, that loan, of, that loan would have been unsaleable anywhere, and it would have maybe been sold for 60, 70 cents on the dollar. So what, the F, what FHA and HUD did is they immediately built the servicer facility that we were discussing that we're asking the FHFA to do. Uh, we're asking Calabria to do it for Fannie and Freddie as well, and they're resisting and they don't want to. But once they created that facility, they eliminated risk for lenders. They created that secondary market bridge for capital. And immediately, FHA rates came way down, way down. I mean, mostly in the twos. Amazing. So what we're trying to do is mitigate that risk of transfer. Gosh, it's like a, it's like a never any story, which actually brings me to down payment assistance and bond loans. Um, so over the last few years, we've been able to use down payment assistance uh, very, very successfully. Uh, Scott's one of the experts in that, in the Cal HFA and GSFA loans. And those are some of the ones that you've seen that got pulled off the market right away. Last. Yeah. For a completely different reason. What was the reason for that, guys? So the reason that those have been pulled from the market is they had this weird clause in their contracts that says if someone loses their job between the time we fund the loan and they buy the loan, they won't buy the loan. So, and they typically take 30 to 45 days to buy loans off of our warehouse lines, where Fannie Mae takes five days. So with Fannie Mae, I'm taking a five-day risk. And if that loan should go into deferral, I still have some outlet for it because it's a pretty clean FHA, uh, Fannie Mae loan. Versus on these loans, you're talking about 105 loan to value with the, you know, they had no reserves, they had low FICO, and they have no equity. So if somehow that loan becomes unsaleable, you could lose upwards of sixty to eighty thousand dollars on just one loan to try to make six to eight thousand dollars. So the opportunity cost of those loans became too great. 
Mm. Um, so some of those are coming back to the market. We turned ours off temporarily. We're looking to turn them back on, but okay. we're looking to turn them back on with, with more security features, higher FICO scores, more reserves, job stability requirements, things of that nature. All right. And we have to pay in gold, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's that. Bars. Oh. Toilet paper. Oh. Toilet paper. Baseball cards. Yeah. <laughs> Comic books. <laughs> Woo. Now they're going to come in handy, all that stack that I just found today. Right. <laughs> so, so where are you seeing interest rates remaining or being in the next month uh, from what you're seeing right now? I see them staying pretty stable right now. In fact, it, the Fed's going to work really, really hard to keep them as stable as possible for all parties. We're talking not just the consumer, but also for the banks and the lenders as well. Because the volatile markets are actually difficult for lenders because, uh, like you said, uh, there's a big word we have to use is hedge costs. I mean, we buy that money um, for you when you lock a loan. And if the market moves a lot, it could cost lenders a lot of money. And we had swings of... 100 to 200 points in a day where a normal rough day is 15 to 30. We had 200 points in a day on a regular basis for a while there. And it was It was havoc. Dude, I saw somebody, somebody made an example of it. And I, I laughed. I couldn't stop laughing. Yeah. It was like, this was the interest rate for like a few days. And then it was a crayon with a little kid scribbling. <laughs> oh, I did that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know that. that was hilarious. It made me laugh so much. I was like, that is so true. That's Here's happening. the bond chart. Look at this. That was what we had to deal with, that bond chart. Up and down. It was crazy. Just whoosh, 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 whoosh. Yes, that, that's, that's legit. Happening. That was a legit bond chart. So now we're going to look at rates remaining relatively low. I would say high twos, low threes consistently for a little bit. Right. Uh, maybe mid to oh, mid let's three. stick with low threes i mean the high yeah. twos you're getting on the 15 year fixed the okay. high twos you're getting on the fha but if you're looking at 30 year money it should consistently be in the low to mid threes for the next at least six months while we work through these problems enter into the official recession um and you know potentially as, as long as a year going forward still uh, I think that we're going to see low rates for some extended period of time. Uh, we are watching the uh, stock market sometimes is a predictor, right? It always tries to go forward and the stock market's predicting a V-shaped recovery. Um, yeah, so. I'm seeing that too. That's what, um, oh, now I'm drawing a blank, but one of the big names uh, was saying V-shaped recovery as well. Guys, same rates for refi or no? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, Some places You're run purchase specials. Purchase. Yeah, I think there'll be purchase specials. I know our company's reaching out, trying to keep the, the real estate market humming with purchase specials to keep affordability and interest rates as low as po possible to attract people to stay in the market because it's a great time for, for time. right now. We do not have enough inventory, bottom line, and that's what we feel that the real estate market will be fine through this. We just have a little fear factor that everybody's got to get, get through, but we think it's a great time to buy because you're going to be able to negotiate when you couldn't before, before you're standing in line. And it's a great time to sell because you don't have the same competition. And like you said, if you price it right, you're going to get multiple offers still. Well, There's you know why, guys? One thing that we're missing is that anybody searching right now for a home is incredibly serious. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Incredibly serious. Good point. And so, I mean... Dude, I want to put up my home on the market. I know anybody coming through is not a licky Lou. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I remember, I, so when I used to do real estate, because I did real estate before I moved into loans full time. That's I it. Remember, I just lost respect for you, Gina. I can't <laughs> <laughs> well, but I remember it was a rainy day and I was going to hold an open house and I told my mentor I was going to cancel it. And he said, no, no, hold it. He said, whoever comes in is serious. And sure enough, I sold that property at the highest anybody had ever sold in the condo complex to a really nice guy. Only like two people came in, but that was it. They were serious. So that's one thing that right now there's a lot less noise and a lot le a lot more real interest. Well, um, and I can speak to that. Gino knows me. I was not in the market to purchase a home for a while there, but now we ha when you have time and you can still virtually go look at homes and you have more time than ever, you're gonna find homes that you probably weren't, didn't know were available or excited about because like I said, I wasn't gonna buy, but I found three homes. I'm like, holy crap, there's some great homes on the market right now that weren't there before. Don, are you, 
What's that? Are you looking right now to buy? <laughs> you buy, you have an agent? No. I'm <laughs> <laughs> That's actually good. I didn't think about that angle. And it better use me. No, but in regards you know, to Basically, that, I, it was a, a year ago, almost exactly. And I wasn't ready to buy until, but there all of a sudden there was homes that were not on the market at all. And it excited me and I freaking bought six months before I wanted to because I'm like, look at this, home's available. I'm excited, I better grab it. Because once the competition hits, your chance of getting that dream home that you like is gonna be gone in seconds. I'm just warning you, it's, it's such a great time to buy right now. With rates where they're at, the competition down, it, it will, the market will get flooded again. And like you said, Tristan, you know, very astutely is the agents that are on this, if they're really smart, they're gonna prep their buyers and their sellers ready for the new market because it's gonna come back and it's gonna come back with a vengeance. That's, yeah, what, hey, that's Scott, our opinion. Scott quarterbacked uh, one, of our, one of our specials that we're running right now, which was uh, for, service, for service people, for medical professionals. Why don't you tell them about that, Scott? Ooh, I like that. Yeah, so we're running, a, we're giving back to the uh, healthcare and service professionals, and uh, we're doing a credit up to $750 for their appraisal. So we're giving them a credit towards their appraisal for up to $750 for anybody in the healthcare industry and uh, I think service professionals and stuff like that. So yeah, policemen, <laughs> firefighters, anybody who's still out there serving, uh, serving us and making sure we're safe, want to give back a little something for them. And, and you know what? A lot of times we don't even need appraisals these days. So if we don't spend the money on appraisal, we'll just give them a credit towards closing. Absolutely. Costs. Absolutely. Yep. yep. I love That's that. One of the things we didn't talk about is that we've been doing a tremendous amount of purchase business now with just drive-by appraisals. Oh yeah. With Fannie Mae, you guys. Talk a little bit about the drive-by appraisals as we close here, just so people understand what that is and how it works. Go for it, Scott. So drive-by appraisals are when the property. Um, so for many years now, uh, all the appraisals get put into a data system, Fannie and Freddie, right? So. And when the appraisals are put into the system, right, all that data is collected. So when we run what's called the automated underwriting approval, it will spit out, hey, the value you're at is based on the data is fine, right? So we get what's called a PIW, a property inspection waiver. So, um, so that's one of the pieces. But then we're getting drive-by appraisals for certain scenarios where they qualify for them, which is simply a drive-by. Really, they're driving by the property and taking some photos and doing the analysis that way. So there's a lot of different guidelines for VA, FHA, and conventional, all that kind of stuff, but that's the high, high level stuff. And if you're a real estate agent, there's BPOs have become important again. Yeah. So there are small credit unions ordering BPOs on properties because they can't access the interior. So uh, banks that do home equity lines of credits and things like that are hiring real estate agents to do BPOs again. Yeah, that's good. I love it, guys. So anything in closing that you want to add that I should have brought up, but I didn't? <laughs> That's how I cover myself at the end. <laughs> no, thank you for being such a giver, though, Tristan, because you're giving up. Like, I see you doing videos and webinars and Zoom, which takes effort and time and planning and care. And it's really cool that you're just rocking it for everybody because... It, we have to go out there and educate everybody as best as we can to get through this and maybe it'll add confidence and ed, you know education and information always makes you feel more confident and it reduces fear and if we can all help do that together i mean scott edwards is doing videos like daily and we try to put ours out and you're doing your webinars and we we, we can just keep doing it and, and uh, we are pretty we're actually excited about uh, where we're at in the real estate community this time Last time, not so much, but this time, yeah. <laughs> this time, I think we hold a lot more of that power, which is you're saying we're, we're going to be responsible for the economy bouncing back. And right. that, that puts a lot of duty on our side, right? So uh, we have somebody who can help us with the rap song. Once we write it, Felicia can sing it because she's on the call and she actually can sing. <laughs> <I love laughs> All right, just remember, Felicia, it's uh, the triple P. We'll call it the triple P song. There we go. Because there's no way you want me or Gino singing it. Trust me. Bill wants to know where you guys, uh, where's your barber? Who's your barber, guys? Just want to know. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. I, I actually, I actually let my wife, I actually let my wife go at it. When, you know, so instead of having a, a two to a one to a zero and all that, I'm like, just go zero. Just just get rid of it. Just just go. Uh, now I came downstairs and my, my fiance is like, did you cut your hair? Yep. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, poor it's thing. The, it's the COVID cut. That's what I call it, the Corona yeah. cut. Yeah. Oh, look, Corona, COVID, nice. Well, <laughs> Scott, Scott, the mortgage doc. Guys, if you have any questions about loans, reach out to Scott. I put out his number there. Uh, great guy. He's our lender. So uh, Don and Gino, thank you so much for being on. Please go to their show, the Don and Gino show, beautiful thing. Uh, guys, thanks for giving so much to the uh, to the real estate world and to the mortgage world. We appreciate all of you. No, sure. thank you. We really appreciate it. Way to, way to go with lab coat agents. Good stuff. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. See you, guys.